Hi, welcome to another episode of I Own a Business, where we focus on helping practice owners grow the practice of their dreams. I'm your host, Dr. Steve Vargo, and I have with me Lynn Lawrence, and, and many of you may have heard Lynn speak before. He is a national lecturer, consultant, and ophthalmic technician. Lynn has a Master of Science degree in organizational leadership. He develops training, compliance, and staff development materials because of his passion to see others grow in their profession. He retired after 30 years of service in the United States Air Force, where he was appointed by the Air Force Surgeon General as the ophthalmic career field manager for 300, it's 540, didn't mean to shortchange you there, 540 optometry and ophthalmology technicians at 90 locations, and he oversaw quality control for 133 optical stores worldwide. So Lynn, number one, thank you for your service. And number two, thanks for spending some time with us today. It's my pleasure. Good morning, Dr. Vargo. I'm excited about this time we're going to spend together. We're going to tackle a topic that we haven't yet covered on this podcast. And in the intro, I mentioned a focus on helping practices grow, but sometimes we need to manage the things that can hinder growth. And something I've observed, Lynn, is maybe you have as well if you're on social media, is when you go to some of these social media sites that are industry specific for eye care, it, it doesn't take very long to scroll down and find those posts of doctor's offices complaining about what we might call difficult patients. And they usually start out something like need to vent. And then it's a thousand word post on, uh, on, on all the details of something that happened with the patient. I, I also find that there tends to be a ripple effect to these encounters because the patient who comes in after that patient that we maybe have a problem with or that we find difficult, the patient who comes in after that person, is that person really getting the best version of us? Your staff, it impacts them. Is your staff really on their A game the rest of the day if they have to deal with a, a problematic or a difficult patient early in the early in the day? And, and we tend to take it home. We, we take it home. We complain to our spouse. Some of these posts that I'm talking about are written at in the evening or somebody typing away on their lunch hour. So, so that's what I'd like to talk about is how do we manage these situations? Because they do affect, they affect us, they affect the doctor, they affect the staff and they affect your business too, because right or wrong, these are the patients who are going home and writing nasty reviews and telling everyone they work with not to come in into your practice. So it, it does have a ripple effect beyond just the, the actual encounter. So that being said, let's, let's peel back the layers on some of this. The patient comes in, let's just imagine the, the fourth was yesterday. Everybody's going back to work. First patient of the day comes in and, and we'll dig into a little bit more about what we might consider that a difficult patient, but let's just say patient comes in, they're angry, they're upset. I think that first minute or two of how we handle that is so important. There, there's a point of no return. It feels like sometimes where we don't handle that, right? You're not getting that patient back. It's going to be a, an uphill battle. So how do you handle the first 60 seconds, the first one or two minutes in, in that situation. So uh, Dr. Vargas, that's a, that's a very, very good point. And, and you are correct. This is like, this is like more of a global issue. It's not just an ophthalmic related issue. Um, if you watch the news or anything else, Americans just seem to be a lot more angry today than we have been in the past. And I, I do think a lot of it has spent off of the, the COVID uh, timeframe. We haven't necessarily recovered from, from that isolation. But the, the, the question that you asked, it's a very good question. That first encounter of the day, that first, uh, that first patient. Well, I will tell you that uh, I do believe that the best part of um, an ophthalmic clinic that is doing uh, very good job handling difficult patients. They started it off with leadership and training. And if you allow your your employees to kind of just kind of rush in at the at the beginning of the morning to try to get things, they're not mentally ready to deal with that tsunami of emotions that walk in the door at the first patient. But you, you want to be on your A game when you open that door. I like to, when I teach the class, I said, it should be like when you uh, open the door, you get this musical sound of magic 
that's getting ready to take place. So it doesn't matter if Drusilla walks in the front door with the negativity, negativity is gonna be met with positivity. And so being professional when you're dealing with that patient is, is critical. And you are correct. The first few seconds, the first few minutes of that interaction, um, I like to teach, you wanna listen. You wanna hear what the problem is because you wanna get through the emotions, you wanna weed through all of the, uh, the hype and find out, okay, what's the problem? And that's what we wanna address is the problem. You wanna, if it's something that we've done wrong, apologize immediately. It's like, hey, I am so sorry. You know, one of the things is like, um, let's say picking up glasses. You told the patient that the glasses will be in in seven to 10 days. They show up on day number seven. And, uh, and so they're expected to pick up their glasses. Well, no one's contacted them to tell them that they're not coming in. And they're, they have a small window. And so they're hyped before they get in there. And it's like, my glasses are not here. And oh, now, now, we're, now we're raging. And, and a lot of our processes can actually prevent that from happening. And when we manage our programs well, uh, prevention is the best cause, but you can't always prevent it. Some people are just wound tight. And so you wanna diffuse them as soon as possible. And you will do that with a greeting, being positive. You are in control, the patient's not in control. A lot of patients think they wanna come in and bully their way through. Oh, no, no, we're not, you're not in control. I'm in control, but I'm gonna do it in a very professional, and polite way. And a lot of that comes through training because um, unfortunately we've had a, a tremendous amount of turnover in our profession of late. And so a lot of people have not been necessarily trained to deal with that difficult patient. So to go back to what you asked is how do we handle this? It starts off with leadership and training. Hey guys, we know that this is, um, this is a possibility. We're gonna deal with this by training you. And we take scenarios from either online or we take scenarios from patients that we've had to deal with. And we use that, those scenarios to train within our meetings. We wanna be ahead of this. We don't wanna do uh, retro training. We wanna do uh, preventative training. And so we teach our staff how to deal with difficult patients on the front end. And there's gonna always be, I, I use the 80-20 rule. 80% 80 of the patients will be within the the guidelines of what you train your staff you want to handle, but then there's about 20% that's outside. I can't believe this happened type of scenario. <laughs> so what do you do? And so um, prevention and making sure that your uh, staff knows what professionalism is. And you don't ever back down from professional behavior. If it's beyond what you can handle, you have, okay, hold on just a second. Let me get the office manager or let me get the, before it escalates to something where it's a yelling or screaming match. And, you know, you see, uh, we don't want to make national media, national social media in a bad way. And we do that by making sure we train our staff. It's important for us to do a good, very good job training. It, it's interesting, the training part, because I, I don't think that's typically part of a training program. How do we deal with these patients? And sometimes if what I hear a lot is if it, if there's not training and it's left to the individuals, you have some people that will naturally approach that in a beneficial way. And then you've got the other ones who don't. And it 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 turns things in, in a, a negative direction. You mentioned two things that I, I always tell people with a difficult patient initially because you want to turn this around you want to de-escalate it because otherwise you're not going to get anywhere until you de-escalate until you bring mm -hmm. that person down they're emotionally charged in the history of humankind lynn <laughs> nobody has ever calmed down from being told to calm down ever <laughs> never has that ever happened so we've got to we've got to de-escalate the situation i think the best way to do that is initially just listen let them get it all out you don't have to agree or disagree they could be wrong they could have misunderstood something it doesn't matter just let them get get it all out and then next i would say apologize well what am i apologizing for it's not my fault apology isn't always an admission of guilt sometimes it's right. just, we can empathize with people we can say i'm so sorry that you had to go through that but in the back of my mind understand that maybe there was a miscommunication here that it's not all our fault but i think once you 
just do that, you'll start to see the person's body language soften, mm -hmm. their voice changes. And now we're getting to a point where they're more open to, to working with us. But I, I think people need to hear that. The apology is so important too, from what I, I, I read this somewhere, and I hope I can articulate it the way I read it. But when somebody feels like they've been harmed by a business, not physically, but some, some kind of, they've been inconvenienced to use your example. Let's just say yes. that they want the business to feel some of that pain. Yes. The apology is actually telling somebody, I feel bad. Emotionally, I feel bad for what happened. And you're taking on some of that negativity. If people don't get that from the business, that's when they start to turn outward and they want to inflict harm in other ways. So yes. that's where people go back to work and say, don't go to that place for your glasses. They go online and leave nasty reviews. So if you're willing to, to take some of that, take some of that heat, they're much less likely to, to go out into the world and, and say nasty things about you. Absolutely. One of the things I failed to mention is I, I do suggest that you take a piece of paper and a pencil. If it's something that if someone says, well, you know, this is the second time or the third time this has happened. I said, let me just document this. Let me write it down. I want to make sure that I get it right so that we don't have to have to readdress this again. So uh, I write it down. I said, let me repeat it back to you. I want to tell you what I heard you say. Because in, sometimes in the emotional outburst, um, what they actually are trying to say doesn't get articulated to the individual trying to hear what is being said. And so I always want to repeat back to them. This is what I hear that you're saying. And so I will repeat it back to them. Did I get it right? And then I said, okay, let's see what we can do about resolving this issue. And then I come up with a plan to actually uh, methodically, step-by-step, uh, step, um, tell them what we're going to do to handle this. We're going to research it. Um, especially if it's something that they said we did incorrectly or we didn't do, I need to go back and investigate that. I'm not going to try to resolve that problem on the spot. One of the ways to actually um, de-escalate is to um, give it some time. I'm going to, if you have time, I'm going to go research that now. But if you're in a hurry, I can go ahead and, and research it. I will get back to you today. And now here's the key. Don't ever promise something that somebody is already angry and don't deliver on it. I mean, I would drive to their house if I couldn't get them on the phone because it's like, dude, I told you today you were going to get an answer on this. And so I would make that a priority. I would make them feel that this issue is important. And I just want to make sure that you understand it's a priority to me. We're not trying to push you off to the side. We deliver high quality customer service. And if you don't feel you've gotten that, I, I'm, I'm going to fix that as best I can if we've done something wrong. But when it, when we haven't done anything wrong, it's kind of, a, uh, you know, most of the time I like to use insurance. Insurance is a, uh, we get a bad deal on insurance. Uh, we don't get to pick the insurance for the patient. We don't get to make the rules for the insurance company. But when the patient's not happy about insurance, it's our fault. <laughs> and so it's like, um, I don't feel I should have to pay this much. Well, uh, that's a really good topic, but that's not one that we can address. We only go by what your insurance company says. So if you would like, then you can come over here and have a seat. We can dial them up for you. You can speak to them about it. But we're not going to put a, an employee on the phone for an hour and a half to talk to your insurance company. Now, I'm not gonna say that, but I, I'm, I just, as a consultant, I have a hard time having a, our employee on the phone for an hour and a half, two hours, trying to resolve an issue that is not an issue between us and the insurance company, it's between the patient and their insurance company. So a lot of it is like patient education as well. Um, the more we explain the process to the patient in the process, the less we're going to have to deal with um, irate patients on, well, well, I didn't understand that. Well, we need to make sure we improve our process so that they will understand the process before we get into it. And now checkout is like the, the people that need, need Kevlar, because if we fail anywhere in the process, checkout's going to know it. <laughs> and so when checkout 
uh, check out folks really have to understand how to deal with uh, difficult patients. And when it's a policy, you ever heard that saying that, that cliche that, and it's a cliche that the patient's always right. Mm -hmm. Well, because I teach around the country, um, I ask the doctors or I ask the office managers, who do you think is always right? This is the patient and, and usually about 60, 70% of the crowd will raise their hand. And I said, no, they're not. The policy's always right. Because the policy either is, is correct or needs to be changed. But that's what we're asking the employees to enforce is the policies that we, we have written out and we've explained to them. And so when it's an issue of policy, it's not the employee's responsibility to actually fix that. It's the leadership's responsibility to fix that. That's why it's so important to have the leadership on board with what's happening with a difficult patient. We can't ignore that, especially when it's a repeated problem. We have to make sure that our staff has been trained, our leadership is in line with the policies that are uh, being executed out there because that creates a lot of confusion for our patients as well. So hopefully as we do our training, uh, we, we cover the policies and how to deal with patients that disagree with the policy. But the policy has to be correct. If we wind up in court, um, the, uh, the judge is going to ask the question about our policies. It's like, can you show me a copy of that policy? Well, we will definitely want to have that in writing. So that's how, this is what we did. This is why we did it. Um, and that really helps uh, in the long term. But dealing with that patient in the interim is something that we have to really address. And it has to be a mental uh, effort to make sure that we remain pro professional and we execute on what our policies are in our office because not everybody's going to agree with it. I find that in some situations too, it can be beneficial to jump on their side of the table on issues, some issues that are beyond our control. If it's our own policy, obviously that's within our control. And maybe mm -hmm. it's just a policy we have to have and not every patient's going to like it. Or maybe if it's, it's a policy that we should reconsider if enough people are complaining about it, but you take something like insurance, you're absolutely right. The patient identifies us and the insurance company as basically the same entity, and they don't mm -hmm. want to hear that it's not our fault. So it, I, I think sometimes it, it can be beneficial to jump on their side of the table and say, oh my gosh, we deal with the same thing. Because uh, most ODs are frustrated with insurance companies as well. So there's a a mutual connection there that I think sometimes we fail to bond on. So when a patient's upset over something with their insurance, instead of saying, well, that's not our fault, go call your insurance company, you know, some jumping to their side of the table and saying, oh my gosh, we have to deal with these insurance companies too. I wish we didn't. Their policies are crazy. Let's see if we can work this out. But now you feel like you've teamed up with the other person. They're not Absolutely. looking at you like, like you're on the other side of the table. So a lot of if what we're going to use the term difficult patients, some sometimes they, a lot of times their their demands are reasonable. There was some expectation that wasn't met, a miscommunication. Sometimes, sometimes we messed up. Sometimes people are unreasonable. Yes. How do we deal with that? I, I remember once, as I'm thinking back when I was practicing a patient who she was, uh, she had a high astigmatism. We had to order a trial set. We didn't have it in the office like most offices wouldn't. And she became furious that we didn't have it there. She still had her contact. This was the weird part. She still had her old contacts that were functioning fine, but she was so upset that we didn't have the trial in the office. She wanted me to call up other offices in the area to see if they had it. one. No, we don't do that. And two, <laughs> they're not going to have it either, but she wouldn't accept that and left very upset. How do we handle those situations where someone comes in, you might have, they might have what you might consider an unreasonable demand. So, so I like that. I like that unreasonable demand. People come into office and they have a uh, expectation of what, uh, what they're going to experience coming through. And the more you know about a patient before they come, the better you can prepare for them. However, there's just things you can't prepare for. And so, and so I, that's, this is when an apology comes in. Our industry doesn't allow, uh, I said, it doesn't matter, our office or any other office you go to, these are way outside the normal parameters. And so I apologize, we just can't have everything here. Um, our office, we don't have the office space and we don't, our, our 
vendors don't necessarily supply us with this information. These are special order. Your, your prescription is outside the norm, what we call normal parameters. And so we have to do um, some special steps to actually facilitate this. But, uh, and, we're, and like I said, this is where a good apology comes in. I'm sorry, but this is just, uh, this is the normal pr um, procedure for how to handle someone with your prescription. But um, I had a patient that had a daughter with special needs. Um, and so she asked, she said, I'm supposed to have it. You guys are supposed to have an interpreter here. And I said, ma'am, did you uh, tell us when you booked the appointment that the, your child had special needs? She said, well, no, I didn't. I said, okay, so in the future, when you book an appointment, not just in our office, but any office, you might want to tell them about your daughter's special needs. And then we can make sure we have all the resources we need when she comes in to address her needs. See, uh, when you know what the, uh, you know, some of the uh, specialties you're going to have to deal with coming in the door, you can better prepare. But when it just walks in the door like a grizzly bear, you grab the shotgun. <laughs> and so, um, a lot of patients are just um, too demanding. Um, I have had doctors reach out to me about too demanding patients. And um, they've gone through all of the staff and they've eaten a staff for lunch and spit them back out. And, and the doctors are saying to me, Lynn, what should I do? Well, I, ha I have a letter that we use to, uh, we can't get rid of everyone, but we can disengage a patient from the pat practice, basically, you're firing a patient. I'm not a big fan of that, but that is a, it sometimes is necessary. And the reason it's necessary is because you, there's just some people you can't please, no matter what you do. You can send a limo to their house, pick them up for the appointment, roll out the red carpet, um, give them a latte at the door, uh, sit them in a chair right at their appointment time, and they're still not going to be able to um, uh, address uh, the patient's needs because the patient has uh, these expectations far beyond anything that any office is going to be able to provide for. Um, a patient uh, was uh, actually terminated from a practice and he said this to the doctor. The doctor said, it doesn't seem like there's going to be anything we can do to uh, please you. And so we're going to give you a copy of your records and a list of uh, offices in the neighborhood that would uh, be able to take care of your needs. And he said, oh, no, no, hold on just a second. My wife will kill me if you guys fire me from the practice. <laughs> she loves coming here. I like coming here. And so the doctor said, I couldn't tell. It seems like you were very um, unhappy with the service that you've been receiving here. And we've done everything within our power to do that. Well, when he found out that this was going to be his last visit. His tone changed because as the leadership, we can't allow patients to come into our office and be so disruptive to the practice that we can't do any business. You think about the amount of money you're going to make on that patient. And it's not just about the money. It is about your reputation in the, in, uh, in the community and everything else. But how far can you afford to go before you need to disengage a patient from the practice. That's something that the leadership will have to um, 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 comment on. But I will tell you this, as a consultant, when I come in and I hear about these patients, I, I go into, I say, hey, show me that patient in your, uh, in your system. And we'll go into the EMR. Not one time is there a documented case of them being disruptive or disrespectful or, I said, guys, if you're going to disengage a patient from your practice, when they start becoming so disruptive, you need to document that. You can't say that we just had a bad day. You want a, you want a history. You want a trail of uh, if it's staff abuse or if it's uh, if they're just having a bad day, still write it down. You know, how many bad days can you afford to put up with? Mm -hmm. my, uh, my area here, we have a lot of military uh, and uh, veterans and PTSD is real. It really is a uh, it's something that is uh, quantifiable and science has already proven it. And we have a lot of uh, PTSD patients and we document in their charts things that will set them off. 
do not walk behind this patient. I mean, things that we know as a staff, we want to avoid to make their visit as pleasant as possible. But this is, this is where communication is a critical part. Uh, training and commit, communication is a critical part. And if um, you're continually talking to your patient in a respectful way, uh, it doesn't mean that they're gonna respond to you the same, but you are never gonna bring your standards down because the patient is irate or upset or being abusive. You know, I, I would find in a lot of cases, I, I, within reason, I tried to give people the benefit of the doubt and just not just in, in work, but in general, because I never know what they're going through and if they're having a bad day and what happened 20 minutes before they, you know, before they, they met up. But one thing I did find relatively consistently, if I could just keep it together mm -hmm. and maintain professionalism and not get triggered not get drawn in and keep it together. A lot of times they would come back, whether it was a follow-up appointment or their next exam, and they would be sweet as sugar because mm -hmm. they knew how they behaved the last time they were in there. They knew that um, they were rude to the staff or rude to me. You don't always get that. And I think it is those repeat encounters where you are dealing with that person who is challenging, who is difficult, and it it maybe rises to a level. I think some of that is subjective. How bad does it have to get before right. we let that person go? I don't know. I mean, it's some of it's up to that office and that doctor. I think there's some things that immediately, you know, you just can't tolerate ever any physical, you know, assaults, verbal abuse, things like that. But you know, it, 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 when it becomes challenging, we've got the same thing at IDOC, a, a sample letter when it's rare, you know, could, yes. could we recover this? It, it's rare, but when you do have to let somebody, let somebody go, can you dig in a little bit more to the training you mentioned before? Now, the things that we're talking about, maybe we have an understanding of, but when we, in, in this era where we're hiring new people and there's a lot of turnover, what areas would you focus on for somebody saying, I really do need to give my staff some training in this area? You know, how do they maintain, do the things we're talking about, maintain professionalism and re remain calm when when dealing with a challenging patient? What would a, a training, not not the whole thing, but some some fundamental aspects of a training program look like for you? So the first thing that, uh, uh, so I like to start with basics like, uh, I didn't, 2012, OSHA came out with the violence in the workplace training. It's mandatory. So we want to definitely talk about, hey, guys, uh, things can go wrong. And then we want to talk about, OK, when things do go wrong, how do we engage? And, and I, I think that one of the best tools to use is um, circumstances or instances that happen in our clinic. And so, or something that may have made national news, we wanna bring something real into the conversation. And then we said, hey, if something, if anything like this happens in our office, this is how we would wanna handle. And, and your professionalism is gonna be put to the test. And you need to know your hot buttons. Like uh, uh, when a patient drops an F-bomb, that's a hot button for me. And so, um, and I volunteered to be our uh, clinic's advocate, patient advocate. So when they have a rude patient, I'm the one they're going to call. So when I walk up to the patient, I'll go, uh, how may I help you today? My name is Lynn. I'm your patient advocate. And I want to hear what your problem is. You tell me uh, what you're experiencing right now. And I'm going to help our leadership figure it out. And so uh, I listen to them. But listening is something that everybody has a different level of patients on. And so, oh, I'm sorry, I, my, um, it seems like I have a contractor outside of my house. <laughs> but, uh, but anyway, the, um, the, the folks that are dealing with the situation that are brought to them, they need to, um, they bring that to the, the group and they say, hey guys, this is what happened. And this is how we would want that dealt with in our office. And and you're all correct. The turnover, it, this is a repeated process. And every, I would say every quarter or, or let's say every time there's a significant event in the office, this is what we did. This is what we did. These are the good things we did. These are th some things we can improve upon. And so, um, and then leadership has to be visible. This is the one thing. It's funny when 
I want to talk to the office manager. And so you go get the office manager. They tell the patient the same exact thing that the front desk or the tech told them. And for some reason, they'll say, well, okay, 90% um, of the time. But they just wanted someone in authority to step out into that. So when we're training, we need to teach. When do we bring people in authority into this scenario? When, I mean, when it is it, when is it a good time to elevate? And I'm gonna tell you, I love the docs. The docs are amazing. So they everybody knows that the buck stops here with the doc. When the doc walks out the back, it's like uh, if we have to go get the doctor, it's not a good thing. I had a patient say, you need to go interrupt your doctor right now and tell him to come out here and talk to me. So that ain't going to happen. <laughs> I said, I am so sorry, but my doctor is sitting with a patient and that patient scheduled that time with the doctor. We don't interrupt our doctor. And I can wait outside the door and wait for the doctor to finish with that patient and see if that doctor has time to come out and talk to you. But we don't interrupt our doctor's patient exams. And so that calmed him down for a second, but I just thought he was pretty bold to even ask me to go do that. But this, this is the culture in which we're dealing with right now. And so trying to get the training down, the whole training program is there should be a formal how to deal with difficult patients. But on a reoccurring basis, we should um, re-emphasize this I would say at least quarterly or anytime there's a significant event in the office to make sure that we bring it to our staff. These are the things we did well. These are some things we can do better. Um, this, this was our policy on this. And uh, we might have to change our policy a little bit. If it's not adequate for this scenario, maybe we need to polish it up a little bit. And I do advocate strongly to re renew your policies, look at your policies every year because the business changes the policies should change with it. So I hope that I hope that did answer the question. Yeah, absolutely. A lot of leadership by example as well, because when you mentioned, and you're right, the buck stops with the doctor. For some reason, when the manager comes up and they have the exact same conversation, they seem more content having had the manager listen to them verbalize the situation. But if you're a manager, if you are in a position of leadership, there's a lot of leadership by example here. How you want the other staff to behave in these situations, make sure that you're delivering on that as well. I would off, well, I, I say often. I, I think fortunately when I was practicing, we had a, a great staff and I didn't, we didn't have to deal with a lot of it because I always thought we did this well. Not perfect, but I always thought we did it well where we would show a lot of empathy and compassion and listening. So we didn't get to that point where things escalated, but when something did happen, that there was an issue, if, if as long as it wasn't a violation of privacy or anything like that, sometimes I would take those conversations right in front of the staff because I mm -hmm. wanted them to see how I interact. I didn't interrupt the patient. I listened to them. I let them talk. I was empathetic. Yes. I apologized because I wanted them to see how I interacted and hopefully they would see the patient's response and their anger start to sort of dissipate. On the apology side, I'll tell you one thing, and any doctor listening to this, it um, it, it was something that, that comes up a lot. The staff would come to me, and if you're running behind, the staff would come occasionally and say, Mr. Smith or Miss Smith is in the exam room and they're getting kind of upset because they've had to wait a while, right? Understandably, it's 20 minutes in, 25 mm -hmm. minutes in, so they always let me knew, know what I was walking into. Yes. So I would open the door and what I would do is I would go straight up to the patient. I already know going in that they're upset. So I would walk, walk in, I would make a beeline for the patient, hold my hand out before I even, this is one situation, I wouldn't even give them a chance to talk, hold my hand out, look at them and say, um, Mr. Lawrence, I'm so sorry about the wait. We got behind. I really apologize. We value your time. Really apologize that you had to wait for so long. You would see the tension just dissipate and their whole mm -hmm. body language soften. A hundred percent of the time that mm -hmm. never did not work. And the, where they were upset because they've been waiting 25 minutes. Now, suddenly it was a, it was over, it, it was over and we could move on with the exam. So there's just a lot of power in, in an apology. It's, it's in my oh, mind, absolutely. it's the ultimate diffuser. Um, okay, can I address something that you just said though? The waiting, I'm going to tell you if the way we keep our patients from getting really upset in the waiting is we communicate to them. 
Now the doctor is in the back dealing with an emergency and everybody else is waiting. If no one says anything to them, everybody's watching or watch, everybody's getting upset. But I found that if you go, if you have someone, I like the text to do it. I don't like the front desk to do it because the front desk doesn't know what's going on in the back. The text, on the other hand, they know exactly what's going on in the back. And have a tech walk out of the back where the action is and go, hey guys, we apologize. We have an emergency going on in the back and it's causing us a delay. We will get to everyone as soon as possible. If for some reason you cannot wait, please go to the counter and we can reappoint you. But I promise you, if you wait, we will get to you as soon as possible. But just it, the difference between letting them just sit there and stew and not know what's going on versus having someone go out and communicate to them. It's the, the, the difference is between night and day mm -hmm. is because people want to know why they're waiting. I made an, I teach that uh, appointment scheduling. I call it the magic of appointment schedule. If you're always running behind, it's, it's not a good thing because patients come with an attitude that, oh, uh, they're always running behind. And so it's kind of a negative environment. So I tell them, when, you, when you're doing patient scheduling, it should be something like uh, uh, it's at nine o'clock, Miss Bailey is going to have her party. And so we should be calling Miss Bailey's name by nine o'clock or at least telling Miss Bailey why she's not being called back at nine o'clock. And so uh, schedule management can help deescalate uh, a, a hostile environment or at least communicating why we're running behind is definitely one of those um, tools that we can use to, to keep everybody calm because um, nobody likes to wait for anything anymore. So we'll close out on a positive note here. There's a lot of opportunity as well with these oh, patients. Yes. I, I think we're looking at the, or at least where our focus has been on the quote unquote difficult patients, right? Yes. But at the same time, the ability as a friend, you know, the old phrase, turn lemons into, into lemonade. Mm -hmm. I think a lot of times these patients come in with low expectations, especially if they haven't been to the practice before and it's not our fault. It's just that there's really crappy service out there everywhere. And I think we're accustomed to that. And we're accustomed to when something does go wrong, not finding somebody who cares and even having the business take a defensive posture, like it's not our fault. So I think sometimes people come in sort of pre-charged, just expecting to get that same low level of, cons uh, of service we can turn that around. I mean, when you take that patient who's, who is upset about something and when they leave that encounter, when they walk out of your office thinking, oh, that experience was different, but in a good way, like mm -hmm. they really, you, you almost go from this point of low to this point of high, as opposed to maybe a lot of patients experience, which is just kind of right through the middle. Right. So it, it just, if you could just comment on that, have you found that to be the case where if you can turn those encounters around, that's where you get the glaring reviews and the word of mouth and the loyalty. I mean, there's so there, a lot of positivity can come through that if if you can do it right. Yes, I, I like to use uh, uh, Disney as a example when I teach about uh, managing expectations for a patient. When they walk through the front door, they may have a low expectation. But when the first words you speak should bring magic to them. Hey, welcome to our office. We are so happy. I know you're new because I saw the schedule. You were a new patient. So welcome to our practice. What can we do? It should start off as something really exciting for them. It's making them feel welcome to be in the practice. And so even if they come in with low expectations, make them raise the eyebrow on the greeting. I went to a practice in uh, Jackson, Mississippi, and uh, there was this young lady who worked the front desk. She was magical. She would call them out by name, and she would, they walk in the front door and she, Miss Smith, how are you today? And I mean, and the patient would turn around and look at her and smile and respond to her, but she wanted them to feel like they walked into her world, and her world was going to change whatever state they were in, she was gonna make it magical for them. Even when you're dealing with a patient that's having a bad day, I'm, I'm gonna tell you a really quick story. We had this patient that came in the door. She was so uh, 
upset and, and, and mean and nasty that the, she made the patients in the waiting room uncomfortable. And so um, when she was done with her appointment, she was leaving, our patients clapped for her to walk out the door. She was so, but, but we still didn't know what was up. I, so I was on call that night and she called in and she said that, she said, I first wanna apologize. Right before I came into my appointment today, I was notified that my only child had three months to live. She said, I want to tell you, everyone on your staff treated me with courtesy, respect, and sensitivity. She said, but I was angry. I, I was processing this news. I should have canceled, but I didn't because I was there and I thought I'd make it through it. But she said, every step throughout your office, your staff treated me with kindness. She said, so I apologize for that. She said, I will have to reschedule because uh, she had a follow-up appointment. She said, I need to reschedule that and um, I'll have to call you guys back in. So I used that as a training opportunity. I went in, I, um, I he said, hey guys, I used her name. I was real cautious with our HIPAA, but I, I had to use her name because everyone that had to deal with her, you know, you deal with those patients, you don't forget their names. Mm -hmm. And so I said, you guys remember? Oh yeah. They were kind of like, yeah, we're well, not gonna forget her. I said, well, let me tell you her story. And I shared the phone call from that night and there was silence in the room when they found out. I mean, our staff still had a tremendous amount of compassion for the lady when they found out what she was going through. And we used that as an example. You don't know what patients are going through when they walk through that front door. And, and a, a another thing, we look at their medication list. Mm -hmm. We, antidepressants, anti-anxiety meds, we know that people are out there were dealing with a lot of things in their life. And if we are the healthcare, the patient-centered uh, business, we're going to try to read through that so that we can take care of them. Um, this might be the only act of compassion that they receive throughout the whole day or maybe the week, but we want to make sure that when they come to our practice, that they enter our magical kingdom. And when they leave, they leave with this perception that they, they can't go anywhere and get care like they receive from us. And so the whole mindset is we're delivering patient care. We're not doing an eye exam. We're not um, handing out glasses. We're caring for people. And if that is our mentality, even when the difficult people come in, we'll be able to handle them and, and, and give them our very, very best. If that doesn't match up, maybe giving them an opportunity to go somewhere else might show them that they did get better with us. But needless to say, um, our very, very best is something that is our responsibility to monitor. And so we want to raise the bar so that no one else can meet the, the same standard that we do. We've used terms like difficult patients and challenging patients. And true to your story, I would venture to say 99% of the time when somebody comes into the office that that really does fit that profile, there's probably something else going on. Yes. It could be big, it could be small, but something to explain their behavior. Um, it, sometimes maybe it'll come out, sometimes it won't, but it, it's hard to stay mad at somebody who keeps smiling at you. So yeah. I think if you can just keep it together, um, and not make assumptions about that person. But I, I've just found that to be the case that, okay, I'll, I'm going to assume that maybe there's something going on here. Let's, I, I'm going to do the best I can for you. But, and partly it's the service-based industry. You have to have to some degree thick skin and be willing to, um, maybe it's be trained or, or be willing to deal with a lot of different personality types that are going to come in. So, so, well, thanks, Lynn. This was great. I think, like I said, it, it's a topic that really goes beyond just dealing with a, um, a difficult patient, but that ripple effect we talked about earlier is what I see. It affects, it affects you. It affects your psyche. It affects the staff and their abilities. It affects the business, and it, I think it's really important to be able to handle those things in a way that allow you to move through those patients and, and hopefully turn it into something positive, but not also not have it affect the rest of your day and end up at eight o'clock at night 
complaining to your spouse about it. Absolutely. You have to be careful taking uh, the stressors from work home. It's a job and it should actually be a part of making your life better, not tearing your life apart. And if the mentality is today, we're going to rescue somebody. Uh, let's, let's figure out those difficult patients need to be rescued as well. Our coworkers need to be wet rescued. And so as, as far as we can go to help someone today, it's going to make a difference for everyone that they will come in contact. If we can change them in the midst of our, our customer service, our customer skills, our people skills, you know, I, you know, I, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a strong believer and I believe that everybody that comes across my path throughout the day, God sent them. And so I want to make the best out of it. And so as my mentality is make the best out of this situation and maybe something will change. We'll be able to retain the patients and everybody's happiness throughout the day and everybody's going to be happy. And so um, I'd like to close with uh, just one little final saying is. Um, when we meet someone, uh, we don't really know what they're going through. But the moment that you have them, you're in charge of what you say, what you feel, what you think. And if you can remain positive through it all, you, will, you might be able to make a change, a difference for their entire life. So I really believe that with my whole heart. So difficult patients are just opportunities. Great place to close. And I'll mention too that Lynn covers this in, in one of his many lectures. And if you ever get a chance to hear Lynn talk, please do. So I'm going to embarrass you for a quick second. When we do our own national conferences, Lynn, I think you spoke there a couple of times, but I have access to the post um, presentation surveys that come in. We use them as a learning experience to find out, you know, what do people like? What do they want to hear? And pretty consistently, I'll read comments like, you know, what would you like to hear at future conferences? I'll read comments like anything by Lynn Lawrence. <laughs> so if you ever get a chance to speak, I, I don't think I've ever heard you speak, but I, I hear all the laughter and the crying and the and and a lot of engagement coming out of the room. So um, so I, I will have to make sure I pop in for uh, for the next one. But thanks again for Lynn. I, a very important topic. I don't think gets enough coverage. So I appreciate your time today. Thank you, Dr. Vargo. Look forward to our meeting you again. So thanks everyone for listening as well. If you'd like more information about IDOC and how we work with ODs and practices to, to help them grow their practice, you can find out more at IDOC.net. So thanks for listening.